today on Family Talk. Well, hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and I'm glad you've joined us for our first broadcast here in 2018. Today's program is about a new movement that helps those who are struggling or grieving through a dark season of their lives. Pain is an unfortunate part of life. But sometimes God allows those painful periods to enter into our lives to push us to rely on Him all the more. Now today you will hear a fascinating interview featuring three women from a new organization called the Faithfully Bold Movement. Nicole, Lisa, and Angela will share with Dr. Dobson how their own stories of loss and battles with cancer compelled them to start a ministry to help those who are hurting in similar ways. Here now is part one of Dr. Dobson's conversation with the ladies from the Faithfully Bold Movement here on Family Talk. I am so happy you joined us today, uh, which is going to be uh, a very emotionally charged program, and I think it's going to touch your heart because we have uh, three ladies here that uh, I have just met. They were just in my office for the first time. They've come here today all the way from Virginia, and uh, we're going to find out a lot about them. They're Nicole Lowe's and Lisa Lowe's, their sister-in-laws, and Angela Hunanian. And I am very proud of pronouncing your name correctly. Thank Did you. I get it right? It was perfect. Do most people not get it right? That's correct. Uh, they butcher it all the time. Uh, <laughs> and all three of you all have relationships with... Um, Liberty University. That's right. That's a great school, isn't it? It yes. sure is. And Nicole, you are a teacher there. You're a professor? I do. I teach in their business department and in their school of uh, general studies. And you have a PhD? I do. I do in business. In business. But you also took some psychology I courses. did. I did. In fact, I... I think all three of you did, didn't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. 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 And then what do you teach? So I teach consumer behavior, um, marketing. I teach uh, business, strategic planning, and technology. Mm -hmm. And we just talked a few minutes ago the fact that I came there to speak. (laughs) A year and a half ago, there were 12,000 students there, and you weren't one of them. I missed it. You didn't show. Go figure. I missed it. I gave my seat up to somebody who really needed it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Baloney. I've heard that one before. Well, I'm anxious to make use of every minute of our time together because you have such stories to tell. And, in fact, the three of you have all been through some real hardship. Is that accurate? It is. Yeah. And serious illness along with other things. Nicole, I'm going to start with you um, and have you kind of recount where you've been. You had a serious bout with cancer, lasted for a number of years. So when I was 36, I was diagnosed with cancer. And, you know, at age 36, you don't ever expect to get that call from a doctor that says, well, you have cancer and you have an aggressive form, so we need to put you on the operating table right away. And that really takes you kind of by surprise. It was stage four, wasn't it? No. Or it, was, it became it, stage. No, it was in the beginning. I see. Um, but the type of cancer I had was fast spreading. Um, and so they had to address it quickly and aggressively so that they could get it out of me before it went on. My family has a real big uh, yeah, you strand lost, of cancer. you lost your mother to cancer, did. didn't you? How old were you when that happened? So my mom battled cancer for nine years. And when I was 20, she died. And so she was pretty much battled cancer you know, throughout my whole teens. Same kind of cancer that Same you kind had? of cancer, yep. And my sister had battled cancer a few years before me, and we'd lost a lot of family members to cancer. Um, and it just was in our family. So I kind of figured I was going to get it eventually because of how aggressive it was in our family. But typically people in my family don't get it until they're 40. That was kind of like the magic number. Um, you know, at 40, you need to be really concerned. And so when I got the call at 36 that I already had cancer, you know, I kind of felt like I'd been sucker punched in the gut. I was like, I have four more years. You know, I shouldn't be Mm. worried about this for another four years. And they're like, no, no, you need to be worried about it right now. And so that was really alarming, I guess. In fact, you had surgery. I had six surgeries. Six surgeries. Yeah, I had six surgeries. And I think one of the things 
when you get that call that's the hardest is I lost my mom to cancer. So I know what it's like. And I you had a daughter. Her die, didn't you? I did. I helped her through the process, you know. And when you all of a sudden get that call and you're all of a sudden the mom in that situation, all I could think about was my daughter. And I'm like, I don't want her to experience what I've experienced, you know. So you were married. I was married. Time, and you had a, one child? I had one daughter, yep. And she was, uh, I guess, two and a half years old. How old is she now? She's six. Yeah. And so um, it was just one of those things where I'm like, she's too young to live a whole life without her mom. You know, and I think the weight of that news and having been through it, seen it and know what I was about to go and have to journey through was just that was a weight on my heart that was way too much to carry. Like I just I oh, like man. it literally ripped my heart to pieces. And it wasn't so much about me needing to journey through it. You know, I felt like, okay, that's going to be hard, but I can do that. What was hard for me is knowing that my daughter was going to have to journey through that. You know, and I'm like, ugh, I can't handle that. And I remember hitting my knees, and I was by myself when I got the call. And I remember hitting my knees and going, okay, I have two ways that I can respond to this. I can get mad and upset, which is, you know, a valid feeling for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and blame God. Or I can trust God that his word is true. And, you know, the verse that popped in my head was Hebrews 4.16. You know, if you go boldly to the throne of grace, he will give you mercy and grace in your time of need. And I thought, by golly, this is my time of need. I need him now more than I've ever needed him in my life. And so as I sat there pondering, I was like, what should I do? And I was like, you know what? God's always been true to me. He's always been faithful through every hard time we've had. I'm going to trust him. This burden's too big for me to carry. And I hit my knees and I said, God... I can't do this. I literally cannot do this. So this came as a real shock to you. You did. You weren't looking for the same problem that your, your mom had had. No. Had I, they not done genetic studies on you? Well, that's what the thing was, is I said, I'm going to do genetic studies. My sister had just found a lump, and she was not wanting to go get it tested because she was nervous knowing that I had another sister who had already battled cancer. And so, like every good sister, you really give your sister a hard time. And I was like, you have to get tested. I will go with you. We will get tested together because I was concerned. Well, what came back is my sister's test was benign, and I came back with cancer. And so— mm. I literally was shocked. Like, it was just one of those things where I'm like, wait, no, wrong sister. She's the one that should have the issue right now, not me. Has your little girl been tested? Um, Not yet, but she will get tested. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just literally every sister in my family, so four sisters, and every single one of them had the same mutation, aggressive mutation of it. And two of us have already had cancer. So Yeah, that must have been an unbelievable shock to feel like you're healthy. Yeah. You go in for a routine exam, and the next thing you know is that you're looking death in the face. Yeah, and that's what it really – it was like looking my own mortality in the face, going, wait, I'm too young. I'm too young to do this. you know. But then you sit there and think cancer doesn't look at an age chart when it decides who gets to go on that journey. you know. It's just one of those things where like, okay, well, this is what you're faced with, so how are you going to handle it? How did you handle the death of your mother? It was hard. I had a wonderful mom. She was a – like a wholehearted, really flamboyant, you know, woman. People loved to be around her. You know, she was a really strong Christian. She walked Christ every day. You know, like when you were around her, you just knew that she loved Jesus more than anything in the world. And I love that, you know. And so when she passed, it was hard. It was hard because, you know, she missed a lot of my first. She missed me getting married. She missed me having a baby. You know, she missed all that stuff because she had already passed on. And so you want to share that with your mom, you of know, course. especially when you're a daughter. And I think that's what it made it hard with me thinking my daughter is going to miss all those firsts, you know. And so that made it tough. And that's when I was like, oh, this is where. Sorry, I get emotional. Yeah. Ah, this is where I need God. Was he there for you? Ugh. Like no other. So I was like, God, I'm going to give this burden to you. You know my situation. You know my heart. I'm going to let you protect me. And if it's my time to go, it's my time to go protect my child. If it's not, heal me. Just do what you do best. You know, be God. Do what you do best. And I'm going to walk alongside you while you carry this burden for me. And I tell you what, I got a front row seat to watching God do what he does best. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. 
which is odd to say because I had total peace of heart. It didn't mean that my struggle went away. The next year, my life was wretched, you know, but my heart was at peace. And to watch God show up and do amazing things through that journey mm. was probably the greatest experience of my life. How about your husband? Was he there for you? So much. Him and his family both were the greatest support ever. Like, I couldn't have asked for a better, more godly, loving, caring husband and his family. I mean, they blessed me with everything that they did. And do, do you have any concept, I'm sure you do, of the number of women, particularly, who are listening to this conversation today? And they have been through that. And you're giving them courage and hope. And uh, that's really what you're trying to do, isn't it? Yeah, that's why we started this movement is to show people that you're not alone on this journey. And, you know, it's great when you have somebody who's been there that says, I want to walk alongside you. I want to journey with you. I want to stand up with you and say, I'm here to support you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to pray for you. You're going to have a lot of dark moments when you're on that journey. But just to know that there's somebody there that wants to walk alongside you and help yeah. you is so, so important. Uh, can I offer you some advice? Please do. You are very articulate and you ought to be speaking on this subject because there's so many people have no idea how to deal with it mm. when it comes. Well, thank and, you. And they go to pieces. They're terrified yeah. that the big C, they call it. Yeah. And here you've got hope to offer and are good at it. You really Aww. ought to do that. Thank you. Now, you come back and tell me if you took my advice. So I will. I, now that I didn't show up at Convo, I will surely take your advice. <laughs> okay. Angela, you're next. I'd like to know your story. How old were you when you encountered it? Well, I didn't have cancer personally. Um, I met Nicole at um, a friend's get-together, and um, at that time my mom was currently battling cancer, um, and I found out Nicole was battling cancer at the same time. And it created a bond for us. It was something that like, I just didn't expect. But when she told me she was battling cancer, I felt like she could relate and she could understand what I was going through in that struggle. Do you agree with what I just told her? I agree, 100%. <laughs> so you should do it. Um, <laughs> Nicole mentioned all those things. You don't want to live your life with your mom missing yeah. those important milestones. Have you had to experience that? I did. And, you know, it's it was really hard to watch my mom, you know, take her final breaths here on Earth, but to rejoice in knowing that she was at the presence of our King. And I think it was a very hard time in my life. It was a hard um, struggle to watch her and see how cancer just ate her body. And, you know, I haven't gone through it personally, but watching my mom go through it and at that time my daughter was three and she watched her grandma speak Christ and speak life and have that hope of heaven and I thought man my life couldn't possibly get any worse and so it was really a struggle for me to watch my mom pass away and try to figure out how to do life after were that were you there when she died. I was. And, um, you know, that was, you know, you know, the nurse was like, I think you should come down. Mm -hmm. And being at her bedside and just watching her just slip into glory was so hard. I can't imagine. It was so I, hard. I was blessed with healthy parents. And my dad died at 66 and my mother at 78. So... Uh, they were uh, long in life, um, but, you know, I just cannot imagine losing them because I was very close to both of them. I'm an only child. It's just I cannot imagine what that is like, and especially when you had a little girl and you contemplated her future. Yeah, you know, my mom was just so great at loving her, and uh, I knew I would miss that more than she would. And missing those important things that my mom would share with her. 
So after that, um, six months later, we found out we were expecting our second child. And we were ecstatic. And I, it was a rough pregnancy from the beginning. But um, my story is the second portion, just like Lisa's story of the nonprofit. Um, we serve, you know, we give care packages to people who are battling cancer or have lost a child. And so um, I found out I was pregnant. And we found out at 15 weeks that she had um, trisomy 18. Oh, really? And the doctors told the us, well, form of Down syndrome, isn't it? It's it's Edward, Edward syndrome, but it's in that same category yeah. with the um, chromosomes. And at first, I thought she had Down syndrome, and I, I love Down syndrome kids, and I was super. It was hard to, you know, it's almost it's like you're kind mourning. It's a form of it, though, because it is mm-hmm. a chromosomal anomaly. Yes. We all long for that perfect baby, healthy yeah. baby. And I think there was a process of, you know, even though I, I know lots of kids with Down syndrome and I love them and I want, I accepted that, but it took me a while. When They're I the went, sweetest kids in the They are the, world, the best. Huh? They are is the best. Is your daughter like that? No, Stephanie, um, she's healthy. And our second baby, Emily, she had trisomy 18. I see. Doctors would tell us to abort and we didn't want to play God in that role. We knew that God numbered her days, and we were going to carry out Uh, as long as we knew God allowed us to have her. But at 31 weeks, my water broke. And so we went into the hospital, and we said, okay, we're going to have a baby. And um, and it was really hard, the flood of emotions that you go through, because— you know, nurses are like, well, we're not going to do a C-section because your baby's going to die and we're not going to put your life on the line. And that's really hard to hear as a mom because you'll do anything for your kids. You'll put your own life on the yeah. line for your kids. A week bit went by and she was doing great and we would monitor her every day. And um, I remember I had a whiteboard in front of my hospital bed by my feet, and I wrote um, scripture on it every day when doctors would come in and they would read what we had to say. Ecclesiastes 3.11 was really on my heart, and I wrote it, and I wrote it in cute little script. I put, God has made everything beautiful on its time. And that was I around. I think I read she lived a little over 200 days. 230 days. 230 days and that Sunday um, my nurse who checked my heart rate like she was there for four days with me she would rub my feet she would come bring me water and she just really took good care of me she was there in my time of need and she checked the Doppler and there was no heartbeat and I looked at my board and I saw God's scripture of he has made everything beautiful in its time oh. and I looked at the clock and it was 311 And I was just flooded with emotion because I felt like he has made everything beautiful in its time. And it's not my timing. It's not what I wanted. But God knew the plan and the purpose of her life, even though it was so hard for us to accept God's Mm -hmm. plan for us and for her life. I wonder if this scripture was ever given to you. It's Hebrews 4.16. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. Did you ever hear that oh, scripture? Oh, we did, from my sweet friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we based our whole um, ministry on, is uh-huh. Hebrews 4.16. We put it on everything because, <laughs> I mean, that literally reigns true in all of our situation because it's our time of need, you know, yeah. that we, we really needed him at these times in our life. Well, Lisa, this is uh, kind of a common uh, theme here. You've been through your tough times, too, haven't you? Yes, sir. And I feel like I've always been a person that wanted to help others. Um, I work in an elementary school, you know, hurting people, um, just everyday people. And then it came to the time where I was hurting and needed help. I was 39 weeks pregnant, just a week from my due date. Went in for my normal routine um, appointment. My doctor took my vital signs. Everything looked good. Then she told me to get on the table, and she was going to just check the baby's heartbeat. Um, Throughout my pregnancy, I was healthy, no complications. I had read in books that there could be complications, but you just don't think it's going to happen to you. Um, The doctor went to check for the heartbeat. You know, there was a silence, and she said, don't worry. You know, um, 
it's just because you're so far along, there's not a lot of room for the baby to move. You know, we're, we're still looking. And then seconds went by. And I could kind of sense the doctor's um, uneasiness. And then I went into panic. And I know at one time my heart started beating so fast that, that we picked up my heartbeat. And, you know, I had that hope, oh, what is that? And it wasn't. You know, I heard the words that no pregnant woman wants to hear. We can't find a heartbeat. So at that time, mm-hmm. she took me in to do an ultrasound just to, to confirm it. How did you cope with that? Oh, it, I think I felt blindsided because, you know, I went in thinking it was just a normal routine appointment and, you know, had no awareness of the outcome. You know, I went from thinking that a week later I'd have a newborn to now the reality, you know, um, hit that I was going to have to go to the hospital, still have to deliver, you know, this baby, um, baby Kennedy, and then walk out of the hospital empty handed. And it really, I mean, it was just a shock. And I think a numbness initially. And I think a confusion. And I struggle with questions, you know, God, how could this happen? Why did this happen? And then also, you know, you have that moment of guilt, like, what did I do to make this happen? Uh, Although did, I did didn't. Did you blame God? We talked about that with uh, Nicole. Did, I, I did felt you like say, how could you do this to me? There, there were times that I was angry. Yes. Why me? You know, why is this going on? I thought, you know, there's so many people that have healthy pregnancies, babies. You know, why, why is this happening now? My husband and I, we were so excited, you know, to welcome our first child. And you have, you know... At that time, we had everything set up, nursery set up. You know, we were ready to, to welcome our, our baby girl. Did the Lord's presence comfort you? Absolutely, as yes. The way Nicole mentioned. Yes. As I said, there was a time, you know, that I did feel angry and that I was confused and the why did it happen. You know, I don't know how people that don't have a faith in God, you know, I have the hope that one day, you know, we'll You're be reunited. See that yes, sir. Girl, yes, aren't sir. You? Yes, sir. Oh, it's a little boy, wasn't it? It's a little girl. It was, was a little girl. girl. So yes. You've had three three daughters. Yes, sir. Yep. You're enjoying parenthood. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, very much so. Very much. Hmm. You never get over the experience and I know Angela, that was our common link. You know, you never get over it, you just get through it. Right after it happened, you had the funeral. You know, there's tons of phone calls, visits, um, that kind of thing. But it's the weeks, months, you know, following. There were times that I was curled up in a ball on the floor, just mm. just crying. You know, just my, my heart really hurt at that time. Is Christmas a tough time for you? It really is. And when October was when Kennedy went to be with the Lord. So anytime fall comes, when holidays come, you're constantly reminded. I write my constituency once a month, and uh, I just talked about the infertile couple and those that have lost children and why we need to comfort them and invite them into our family. Some, some women who have never been able to have Children have suffered tremendously at Christmas time because they they can't really enjoy what it's like to to have fun with a child at yes, Christmas time to introduce that youngster to Jesus as the time goes on. Yeah. Um, we're really out of time uh, for today's program. I want to pick up next time with what you all did with your pain because that is a wonderful story. Uh, You didn't just leave it there. You have used it for God's purpose. And uh, if you'll be with us again, and of course you will, you've flown all the way here. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. (laughs) Right. Sure. Uh, We will uh, pick up uh, next time with that that part of your story. And uh, be with us, folks, because this is an uplifting message. What an incredibly vulnerable and moving interview here on Family Talk. If you'd like to learn more about the Faithfully Bold Movement, head over to our website at drjamesdobson.org. There you will find a link to their website and information on how you can donate to their ministry. Also, how you can send one of their care packages to someone in your life who needs it. Again, you'll find all this information at drjamesdobson.org. Have you or someone close to you faced the darkness of losing a loved one? Or do you know a friend or family member fighting cancer? 
we encourage you to go to our website and get a free download entitled, When God Doesn't Make Sense. This resource tackles the hard issue of why bad things happen in spite of the hope we have in our loving and unchanging God. To receive this free download, go to drjamesdobson.org and search for the title, When God Doesn't Make Sense. Finally, we'd love to encourage you and lift you up during your time of need. If you're seeking prayer for whatever you're facing in life right now, please call 877-732-6825, and one of our customer service representatives will be happy to pray with you. Again, that number is toll-free, 877-732-6825. Thanks for listening to today's broadcast, and be sure to join us again next time for the conclusion of our interview with the founders of the Faithfully Bold Movement, right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, wishing you a happy and prosperous new year. Family Talk is not associated with Focus on the Family.